Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in this session we are going to talk on diagnostic techniques and biomedical analysis. First, we are going to talk on cancer biology and in our second half we are going to talk in terms of cardiovascular disease. Friends, for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Dr. Amit Bhattacharya is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjas College, University of Delhi. Dr. Bhattacharya has immense experience and his experience always help us out in getting in-depth knowledge on various topics and issues of zoology. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Amit Bhattacharya on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. I repeat, our number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. All dear friends are requested to call in the last ten minutes of the lecture so that first you could have deep insight into today's session. And yes, of course, in the last ten minutes, we promise to give answers to your queries through Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Now, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Bhattacharya, once again, and would request him to give us in-depth knowledge on today's topic too. Now, sir, welcome to the session. Much. Thank you very much. Dear viewers, in this part of the lecture, I will be talking about the various diagnostic methods or the techniques and subsequently how exactly we analyze the result, the biomedical analysis of the results which are given up by these diagnostic techniques. So, I will focus upon the various techniques such as the immunohistochemistry, subsequently the lab techniques, then the PET scan, biopsies and the other techniques and then we will show you how exactly these results are interpreted accordingly. So, before moving into the diagnostic techniques in used in the pathology have been broadly classified into various section like such as the histopathology, cytopathology, hematopathology, immunohistochemistry, microbial, microbiological examination, biochemical examination, cytogenetics, molecular techniques and the autopsy. Now, there is a difference, huge amount of difference between the screening and the diagnostic test. A screening test is generally intended to uh, screen out what exactly the person is suffering from. So, this is the first level of the test which is done by the doctor to give a initial examination or initial report what exactly the disease can be. Subsequently, if the person is found positive for that particular screening test, he is recommended for further tests which are called as the diagnostic test. So, there is a difference between the screening and the diagnostic test which we will find in the subsequent slide. Now, the screening tests are generally done apparently on the uh, healthy individuals while the diagnostic tests are done on those which have got an indication of sickness or some kind of abnormalities. Now, the screening test is applied to groups, subsequently the diagnostic test is applied to a single patient and all the diseases tests are being considered or done. Test results for the screening test are generally arbitrary and final while the diagnostic tests are not final and subsequently there are different diagnostic tests or different levels of diagnostic tests which are done up and a sum of all the results from these diagnostic tests is subsequently deciphered out. Now, the screening tests are generally less accurate and less expensive while the diagnostic tests are more accurate and they are more expensive. The screening test is not ba a basis of the treatment, but a diagnostic test is for formed as the basis of the subsequent treatment regime. Now, in the cancer biology, the molecular diagnosis in the older wave were broadly classified in the pathological tests such as the biochemical, immunohistochemistry and the other tests. But the latest new methods which have come up in the cancer biology is this taking up the patient's tissue sample or the blood sample and then subsequently moving into the proteomics and the genomics part of that particular sample. Now, in the proteomics part, the various proteins how exactly these proteins concentration are increasing, decreasing or remaining same with, with uh, reference to the uh, standards are taken place while in the genomic part how exactly the genes are getting activated or down repressed or they are getting neutralized over there is being checked with the help of the various techniques like the sequencing microarray techniques and the other techniques. So, the latest kind of molecular diagnosis in the case of the cancer is basically the proteomics and the genomics regimes. Now, the standard uh, biopsy and there are different liquid biopsies which are there. So, standard biopsies are basically time intensive procedures. They are localized 
for sampling of tissue not easily obtained and they have got some pain and risk which is involved in them. While in the case of the liquid biopsy, it is quick <coughs> sorry, and it is a comprehensive tissue profiling which it gives up. It is easily obtained, there is minimum risk of pain and invasive uh, procedures are being done. Now, the blood hemogram or the blood which is taken up from the patients gives a variety of various distinctions. So, it helps the doctor to screen a wide range of conditions and the disease. It helps to diagnose various conditions such as anemia, infection, bleeding disorders, leukemia, etc. Thirdly, it monitors the conditions and the effectiveness of treatment of a diagnosis is established. So, there are different implications of this one. Now, we come into the one of the first immunohistochemistry methods which is, uh, is done which is called as the immunofluorescence. So, in 1944, Albert Kuhns showed for the first time that the antibodies which are labeled with molecule that have a pro property of fluorescence can help us to give a image of the cell or the tissue section. So, in the immunofluorescence what happens is if we see the red color antibodies labeled with a fluorescent tag. Now, these red color primary antibodies or the labeled antibodies are very specific to certain protein markers which are present on the cell surface or the tissue surface. Now, if we have got a sample of tissue and we want to check for a particular presence of a particular protein, what we can do is we can put the labeled primary antibody into that sample and subsequently these primary labeled antibodies will go and bind to the proteins which are specific to their site. Now, these primary antibodies as they have got a fluorescent tag, tag as soon as the signals are emitted, these fluorescent tags emit certain kind of fluorescence which can be copied upon by the detectors which are present. So, the fluorescent compounds such as the fluorescein and rhodamines are commonly used in the case of the immunofluorescence. Now, if we see the subsequent uh, diagram over here, the immunofluorescence is further uh, shown uh, in a much more greater detail. So, we can see on a slide, if we have got a cells with the membrane antigens present onto it, we put the primary antibody which are specific to these membrane antigen. Now, these primary antibody in the case of the direct method, they have got the fluorescence tag which is present on the top of it. Now, these fluorescence tag as soon as they get these signals, they emit the fluorescence which can be captured with the help of the immunofluorescence microscopes. Now, there are different methods such as the indirect methods with the fluorochrome labeled anti isotop antibody and the indirect method with fluorochrome labeled protein A antibodies also. Now, the next method which is generally used is called as the immunohistochemistry or IHC. In the immunohistochemistry, it makes the possibility to visualize and dist uh, visualize the distribution and localization of specific cellular components within the cell or the tissue sample. Now, what happens is suppose we want to uh, find out whether the specific or uh, protein is present or the antigen is present within the cell or on the surface of the antigen. So, what we do is along with the sample, we incubate that particular sample with the primary antibodies. Now, the primary antibody which is shown red in color will go and bind to the specific antigens which are present on the surface or within the sample. Now, subsequently they are treated with various buffers and the secondary antibodies are then incubated. The secondary antibody has got a fluorescently labeled tag on the top of it. Now, this secondary antibody will go and bind to the FC region or, or the constant region of the primary antibody. As the fluorescent tag is present, what will happen is it will subsequently give certain kind of fluorescence which can be copied and detected by the detectors which are present over there. Now, if we see the image over here, this particular image shows the fluorescence immunohistochemistry detection of the cytokeratin 18 in the case of the colon carcinoma tissue. So, we can see in the colon carcinoma tissues when they were incubated with biotinylated anti cytokeratin 18 antibodies, the fluorescence was emitted which came up well 
in the cytological study. So, we with the help of these images, we can say what exactly and how exactly these proteins, specific proteins are present within those tissue or the cell sample. Now, the next one which is there is called as the immuno electron microscopy. Now, the immuno electron microscopy, it helps uh, with the help of the fine specificity of the antibodies which acts as a powerful tool for visualizing the specific intracellular tissue components. Now, in this technique what is done is a electron dense label is either conjugated to the FC portion of a specific antibody for direct staining or it is conjugated to a anti immunoglobulin reagent for indirect staining. Now, there are different electron dense labeled molecules which are present which includes ferritin and colloidal gold. Now, if we see the image over here, this is a immuno uh, electron micrograph of the surface of a B cell lymphoma, uh, which is stained by two major antibodies. One antibody uh, stains for the class 2 MHC, which is labeled with 30 nanometer gold particle, while the other one classifies the MHC class 1 molecule labeled with 15 nanometer gold particle. So, we can see the black spots or the black dots, which characteristically find out where exactly are the MHC 1 and MHC 2 class of protein molecules present on the surface of the B cell lymphomas. So, these immuno electro microscopy also plays a very important role in the verification of the diagnostic techniques. Now, one of the major techniques which are done in the cancer biology is the biopsy. So, biopsy is basically a removal of a piece of tissue or sample of cells from the body of the patient, so that it can be analyzed in the laboratory. So, if there is certain kind of signs or symptoms which the doctors identifies, he subsequently tells the patient to go for a biopsy. Now, the biopsy have been broadly classified into major steps. One is called as the needle biopsy, which is further divided into two major process. One is called as a fine needle biopsy, the other one is called as the core needle biopsy. Then there is excisional or the incisional biopsy, endoscopy biopsy, laparotomy, on thoractomy biopsy, skin biopsy, and lymph node mapping and biopsies, which are also there. Now, the needle biopsy, the first kind of the biopsy is generally it is needle biopsy is augmented with the help of the ultrasound transducers also. So, the ultrasound transducer helps to categorize why exactly the uh, cell mass or the lump is present. So, needle biopsies is a medical test which is performed by the radiologist to identify the cause of the lumps of the mass or the abnormal conditions in the body. So, we can see over here in this image with the help of the x-ray or the ultrasound the patient, the doctor is characterizing where exactly the mass of cells is present within the lung tissues and then with the help of the needle these tissue samples are being aspirated out. Now, the needle biopsies is further divided into major classes. One is called as the thyroid biopsy, the other one is called as the ultrasound guided breast biopsy, the third one is called as the liver biopsy. We will come into them each of them one by one. During a needle biopsy, the doctor generally uses a special type of needle to extract the cells from a suspicious area or the area where the mass of the cells have been detected. Now, we come first into the bone marrow biopsy. So, bone marrow is specially a spongy material which is present inside the larger bones and these bone marrow are the areas where the red blood cells or the hematopoiesis process generally takes place. So, hematopoiesis process is basically the creation of the red blood cells and the white blood cells within the body. So, the bone marrow have got a micro environment where exactly these hematopoietic stem cells or the pluripotent stem cells then lead into the lymphoid and the myeloid uh, kind of lineages and subsequently they form the white blood cells or the red blood cells or the other cells. So, bone marrow biopsy is commonly used to detect a variety of blood problems such as the non-cancerous and the cancerous properties. So, the bone marrow biopsies helps the doctors to uh, trace out whether the patient is suffering from leukemia, lymphoma or multiple myeloma. Now, what exactly is being done in the bone marrow biopsy? So, in the bone marrow biopsy, a bone marrow aspiration biopsy, what happens is a thin needle is put into the bone marrow, especially in the pelvis 
bone over there, if we can see the image over there, then a small amount of liquid bone marrow is then aspirated out with the help of the specialized needle. Then subsequently these samples are treated with various procedure to check what kind of uh, cancers the person is suffering for, if it is a cancer or if it is a non-cancerous part which is there. Now, if we see the bone marrow patient biopsy cells uh, slides which have been prepared over here, this is a bone marrow biopsy which confirmed a case of myeloma. So, the myeloma cases can be confirmed with the help of the various stains. The first staining which have been used is a hematoxylin eosin stain which is done over here. Then comes the immunostain with which can detect the CD138 plus cells over there. Then there is a immunostaining for the kappa light chains and the immunostain for the gamma light chain. So, with the help of these various staining procedures, the doctor can then say that yes, the patient is suffering from this particular type of cancer, leukemia, lymphomas and the various other types of the cancer. Now, the other one is called as the core needle biopsy. So, core needle biopsy uses a long hollow tube to extract a core of tissues. Here, a biopsy of the suspicious breast lump is being shown over here. The core uh, which is being extracted over here with the help of the ultrasound transducer and then sent to the laboratories for further testing. So, this is a core needle biopsy which is done over here. Now, there are different other kind of biopsies which include the thyroid biopsy. So, in this the thyroid samples are being taken up, the nodules from the thyroids are being taken up. During a thyroid biopsy, the doctor uses a needle to remove a small amount of suspicious tissue from the thyroid gland and ultrasound transducer is used to create the image which helps the doctor to guide the needle into that suspicious area or that particular area. So, with the help of these particular ultrasound transducer, the doctor can uh, guide or navigate to that particular area where exactly the lumps are present. Now, the next one which is being shown over here is called as a liver biopsy. So, the liver biopsy is basically a procedure which is done to check the lumps or the masses present within the livers. So, a small sample of the liver tissues is uh, detected taken out with the help of the needles, uh, specialized needle. So, liver biopsy is commonly performed by inserting a needle, thin needle through the skin into the liver and with the help of the ultrasound or the x-ray images, the particular sectioning or the particular positioning is changed and subsequently the needle is sent to that particular part. Now, the next one is called as the endoscopic biopsy. So, endoscopic means anything which is put inside our gastrointestinal tract. So, the endoscopic biopsy, the doctor uses a thin flexible tube which is many a times referred as the endoscope with the with a light on one end to see the structures inside your body. So, in the endoscope, one of the end is fitted with a camera with a light. So, the light and the camera helps us to get a image how exactly the uh, gastrointestinal tracts are functioning and is there any kind of um, extra activity which is happening over there. So, in the endoscopic procedure, there involves a long and a flexible tube which is called as the endoscope which is put down the throat into the esophagus. A tiny camera is present on the end of the endoscope so that it helps the doctor to examine your uh, esophagus, sto stomach and the beginning of your small intestine which is called as the duodenum. So, the endoscopic helps the doctor to give the get the images and subsequently with the help of the images, he can find out whether the person is suffering from any kind of ulcers or any kind of cancerous formation within his intestinal tract. Now, the next one is called as the colonoscopy. So, the colonoscopy as the name suggests is the endoscopic which is done for the colon part. So, during a colonoscopy, the doctor inserts a colonoscope which has got, which is a thin flexible tube and one of the end is fitted with a camera. So, it is put into the rectum to check for the abnormalities in the entire colon over there. So, we can see the image over here in which a colonoscope has been put up and the colonoscope helps the doctor to check the entire colon 
present within the gastrointestinal tract and if there is any kind of abnormality found within them, the doctor can subsequently go for that particular testing or that particular examination. Now, one of the most important screening te diagnostic technique in the case of the cancer is called as the PET scan or the CT scan. So, the PET scan stands for the positron emission tomography scan and the CT scan is basically computed tomography scan. Now, the PET scan and the CT scan helps to detect and determine the stage of the cancer. It helps to determine the metastasis to evaluate the effectiveness of cancer treatment. So, it helps the doctor to evaluate the process of cancer at various stages and how exactly it is being treated with the help of the various drugs. Now, if we see the image over here, this is a PET scan which is shown over here. The PET scan is showing the, uh, the particular images in the place of the lungs, liver and the bone. So, the PETs can help the doctor to evaluate what exactly, uh, where exactly the cancer cells are forming, how exactly the metastasis has occurred across the body and when the patient start taking up the chemotherapy or the chemotherapeutic drugs, how exactly the scanning or what exactly is the sizes of the lumps, whether it has decreased down and how exactly it is being affected by that particular drug is also checked. Now, for, uh, for the PET scan, there are various ways which are there. So, we, we discussed about the various scanning things over here. So, in the immunohistochemistry methods, we discussed about how exactly the fluorescence microscopy and fluorescence immunohistology are helping to check out what exactly, how exactly the particular markers are present within that tissue samples or the cells are present or not. And in those particular markers, we were checking about whether that particular proteins are present or not. Because in many of the cancer, it has been characterized that particular protein um, markers or protein targets are present within that particular cancer. So, there are different antibodies which have been deciphered and discovered, which are specifically against that particular antigens or the proteins present on the surface within them. So, with the help of the immunohistochemistry and the immunofluorescence, it can be checked whether that particular markers are present within the cell or on the surface of the cell. Then, with the help of the various biopsy techniques, it can be checked that whether that can, uh, what kind of cell mass that is uh, present, whether it is a non-cancerous or cancerous. If it is cancerous, then it is a benign cancer or a malignant cancer which is there and how exactly the metastasis of that particular cancer has taken place. It can be also checked over there. Then in the biopsies, there are different needle, proced bi needle procedures such as the needle biopsy, then comes the core uh, needle biopsies which are there. So, in the needle biopsies, the needles uh, they are inserted with the help of the x-ray and the uh, uh, ultrasound transducers which help to direct the doctor to put the needles at the specific locations in the cell masses and then aspirate out certain samples from that particular part and subsequently going for the biopsy or the cultural techniques over there. And then in the case of the core needle biopsy such as uh, we have shown in the case of the breast cancer, how exactly the samples from the breast are taken up and then subsequently it is checked with the help of the various techniques uh, over there. Then there are various endoscopic uh, techniques which are there. In the endoscopic techniques, it basically involves the, uh, the thin flexible uh, tube which is there, which is fitted with a camera uh, and a light at one of the end. And with the help of this one, these are inserted from the throat into the esophagus, into the stomach region to check whether how exactly the upper gastrointestinal tract is functioning. Is there any kind of formation of any lumps or not? And then subsequently checking for those things. Then becomes the second part of the endoscopy in which, which is called as the colonoscopy. In the colonoscopy, the colon parts are being checked with the help of the colons. Uh, endoscope. So, the endoscope, uh, endoscope is then inserted into the colon part and subsequently the colon parts are checked how exactly the colon parts are functioning. Then comes 
the PET scans or the CT scans which is the positive emission tomography scans or the uh, uh, computed tomography scans. So, these scans helps to detect what kind of cancer it is, how exactly the cancer has spread to the other part, is there any metastasis which have been found in those particular cancers and if found after the treatment regimes or the chemotherapy, how exactly they are functioning for that particular processes uh, like this way. And the PET scans gives us a total imaging how exactly the, uh, the uh, cancer, after the cancer treatment, how exactly the cell masses has shrunken and how exactly the patient is getting rid of the cancers from his body. Now, if we see uh, the last slide over here, this, this last slide shows how exactly uh, the, tree, the particular food regimes should be there for a particular uh, patient, uh, patient and a person just to get rid of the cancers and not avoid the cancers like stages. So, the vegetable and the fruits has to be maximum in the diets in that particular thing. So, basically the green vegetables and the fruits are essential part of them because they act as the antioxidants and helps in the immune boosting properties over there. Then the grains are present at a uh, should be given at a larger quantity, especially the cereals which are there. Then the, uh, there should be low fat dietary which is being recommended. So, uh, then the seafood and the poultry meat should be taken at a very low amount. Then the beans, nuts and seeds also plays a very important role and the oil salads uh, the uh, plays an important role, they, but they have to be give, given at a very low quantity and the sweets which plays a part of it, but it has to be given at the minimum quantity. So, with the help of the pyramid chart, we can see the maximum amount of things which should be given to a patient suffering from these particular diseases are the vegetables and the fruits, then the grains and subsequently the other things should be given to that particular person. So, in this part of the lecture, I covered upon the diagnostic techniques uh, and the bio, bio um, medical analysis of the results which come out of these biological techniques and how exactly they interpret us, they are, they are interpreted and what exactly idea they give to us. So, with this note, I come to the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this uh, session. Friends, you are requested to be with us as we are back after a short break and we are going to discuss more. So, be with us. Keep watching us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to this session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on one of the important and interesting topics and the topic of discussion is diagnostic techniques and biomedical analysis. In the previous session we discussed on cancer biology. In this session we are specifically going to talk on cardiovascular disease and for the discussion of the topic we have with us in our studios Dr. Amit Bhattacharya. Dr. Amit Bhattacharya is Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Ramjis College, University of Delhi. Friends, if you wish to ask questions from Dr. Amit Bhattacharya on today's topic then do call us through our toll free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. Now I would like to welcome our Yes, Dr. Amit Bhattacharya, once again. Thank you very much, ma'am. 
Dear viewers, in this part of the lecture, I will be focusing upon the various diagnostic methods or the tests which are there for the cardiovascular diseases and how exactly the results for these diagnostic tests are then interpreted or the biomedical analysis of the techniques. Before going into that one, we should know what exactly the cardiovascular diseases are. So, globally cardiovascular diseases accounts for about 17 million deaths in a year, approximately one third of the total. These are the statistics given by the World Health Organization and the major cause of the cardiovascular diseases is the hypertension which accounts for about 9.4 million deaths worldwide every year. So, we can see how exactly the hypertension or the high blood pressure is causing the various diseases. Now, if we see the image over here, the uh, cardiovascular diseases are mainly caused by two things. One is called as the hypertension and subsequently there is a atherosclerosis. So, the hypertension leads to the hypodynamic stress, subsequently the oxidative stress which leads to the inflammation and which leads further into the atherosclerosis. So, these are the various things which will be discussed in the subsequent slide. So, the high blood pressure or the higher pressure in the blood vessels, so it means that the higher the pressure in the blood vessels, the harder the heart has to work in order to pump blood. So, if it left uncontrolled, the hypertension can lead to a heart attack or subsequently it can lead to the enlargement of the heart and eventually the heart failure. So, there are different um, uh, parameters which are attached to the high blood pressure. The pressure in the blood vessels can also cause the blood to leak out within the brain and this is majorly called as the stroke. So, hypertension can also lead to kidney failures, blindness, rupture of the blood vessels and the cognitive impairment. Now, the hyper uh, cardiovascular diseases has got two major uh, phenomena into this. One is called as the arterial sclerosis which means the disease of the media alters stiffness. So, if we can see there is a lumen which is present and the media which is uh, in a uh, which is present shorter in the case of the normal artery has broadened in the case of the arteriosclerosis patient. While the other one is called as the atherosclerosis which is the disease of the intima which alters conduct. So, we can see in the case of the normal artery, the intima layer which is shown brown in color is normally present, but in the case of the atherosclerosis patient, the intima layer increases because of the presence of the plaque. So, we can see over here the atherosclerosis, there is a formation of plaque which is basically the lipid materials or the fatty materials which get accumulated in these particular blood vessels, while in the case of the arteriosclerosis, there is a thickening of the inner wall and the central wall of the artery. So, these are the two different conditions which are present in the case of the cardiovascular diseases. Now, the cardiovascular diseases uh, broadly consist of the heart, blood vessels and the blood. So, the it functions in the transport of the gases, nutrients, waste and the hormones over here. Now, if we see over here, the cardiovascular sh is shown <coughs> in the uh, as blue and red in color. Now, the blue color shows the venous blood or the deoxygenated blood, while the red color vessel shows the oxygenated blood. And central to that one is the uh, heart, which pumps the blood into the various parts of the body. So, the various arteries and the veins, the important ones are shown over here like the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary vein, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava which is shown, femoral arteries and veins are also shown over here. Now, the cardiovascular diagnostic techniques are majorly done to understand the disease, the injury, if there is any injury to the heart and the cardiovascular system, congenital disorders whether it is present at the birth are there or not and what are the acquired abnormalities of the heart which are being done ac uh, around the lifestyle related diseases. Now, the first technique in the case of the cardiovascular disease is called as the electrocardiogram. 
So, in the case of the electrocardiogram, it tests and records the electrical activity of the heart and shows the abnormal uh, rhythms within the heart and it detects the heart muscle damage over there. So, we can see the patient over there lying on the bed. On to the bed, if we can see there are different electrodes which are attached to the chest, upper arm and the legs over there. So, with the help of these electrodes, the electrical activity of the hearts are recorded and they are subsequently transferred into the machine which is called as the electrocardiogram or the EKG machine or the ECG machine. So, the ECG machine then comes up with a rhythmic recorded uh, uh, readings which are generally re recorded as PQRST uh, waves. Now, the PQRST waves represents the various uh, parts of the heart functioning. Now, if you see over here, this is the biomedical analysis of the ECG readings. So, the heart reading is basically uh, classified as the P which is the atrial uh, depolarization, then the QRS which is the ventricular depolarization which is seen over here then the T which is the ventricular repolarization which is seen over here. So, we can see over there the activation of the atria, then the activation of the ventricles is also there and then the recovery wave which is shown over here. Now, in the first ECG if we see this, this is showing a normal heartbeat, then the second ECG is a fast heartbeat which is shown over here. So, we can see there is a change of the uh, electrical rhythms within that particular ECG report. Then there is a slow heartbeat which is shown over here and the fourth one is a irregular heartbeat which is shown over here. So, with the help of these ECG reports, we can decipher out what exactly and how exactly the heart is pumping blood into the various organs of the body. Now, the ECG waves or the PQRS waves helps the doctor to recommend what exactly tests should be done subsequently to check and validate the results. Now, the EKG or the ECG report, it uh, displays each heart as a series of electrical waves. So, the contraction wave which blood pumps uh, are represented by the P wave and then there are QRS complex and the T wave. So, the P wave represent the activity of the heart's upper chamber. QRS complex and the T wave represent the activity of lower chambers. So, with the help of these ones, we tend to direct about what exactly the heart is pumping upon. So, in this picture, if we see, we can see the electrodes which was shown in the previous image, why exactly they are being placed at the various locations like the chest, upper arm, then at the uh, leg regions they are being placed and these electrodes takes up the recordings or the electrical impulses from that particular portion and then they are transferred into the ECG or EKG machine and they, they come up with a wave whether the heart is a normal heart, irregular beating heart or fast or a slow beating heart. Now, the other test which is generally recommended by the doctors is the stress test many a times referred as the treadmill or the exercise ECG test. So, these tests are generally done to monitor the heart while we you are walking the patient is walking on a treadmill or a pedal a stationary bike over there. So, the doctor monitors the breathing and the blood pressures of the patient. A stress test is helped to detect the coronary artery disease and it determines the safe levels of exercise after a heart attack or heart surgery. These tests are also done using special medicines that stress the heart in a similar manner as exercise does. So, the stress test which is also called as the treadmill or the exercise test, we can see the image over here. The patient is then run onto a treadmill and the breathing and the blood pressure of that particular patient is then monitored. So, with the help of the breathing and the blood pressure monitoring, the doctor can suggest whether the patient is suffering from coronary artery disease or whether there is some kind of other disease the person is suffering from. Now, if we see the image over here, this image shows a patient how exactly the blood pressure cuff 
is attached to his arm, then the electrodes are attached to the chest and the electrodes are connected to the machine. So, the patient is then uh, start walking on these uh, treadmills uh, or the stationary bike and subsequently the ECG or the EKG machine records the impulses or the heartbeats into those ones. So, the breathing as well as the blood pressure of the patient is then recorded onto this EKG or the ECG machines over there. Now, why exactly we need a treadmill test? Now, the treadmill test is being done to check the various levels of a non-functionality of the heart. First, it determines and helps the doctor to check the blood flow to the heart during the increased level of activity. Secondly, it evaluate the effectiveness of heart medication to control the angina. Uh, third is it, it, it determines the li uh, likelihood of having coronary heart disease and the need for further evaluation. Fourth, it helps to check the effectiveness of the procedures which are done to improve the blood flow within the heart vessels in the patient specially suffering from the coronary heart diseases. Fifth, it helps to identify the abnormal heart rhythms or the abnormal heart functioning. And sixth, it helps to develop a safe exercise pro program or the regime for a patient who is suffering from some kind of heart ailment. Now, the next one which is recommended to a person uh, having a cardiovascular disease is called as the echocardiogram or many a times referred as echo. So, echo is basically a non-invasive test which is used uh, in which sound waves are used to evaluate the heart's chamber and the valves and its pumping function. So, the echo sound waves create an image uh, on the monitor as the sound probe is passed across the skin over the heart. So, we can see over here the technician is moving the ultrasound transducer uh, around the heart and with the help of the sound wave he is producing a image of the heart's chambers, walls and how exactly the heart pumping is being done. So, the echocardiogram or the echo helps the doctor to evaluate the functioning of the heart, the heart chambers and the valves and especially the pumping functioning of the heart. Now, if we see the image over here, the image shows how exactly the, uh, the technician or the doctor does a echocardiogram. So, in the echocardiogram, the patient is uh, uh, moved to the left side, he lies on the bed on the left side and then subsequently the ultrasound transducer is moved uh, around the heart region on the skin. So, the sonographer moves the transducer on the patient's chest and subsequently the electrode patches attached to the chest uh, transfers the electric impulses onto the ECG machines. The EKG readings or the ECG recordings are also, um, also recorded along with the images which are being created of the heart chambers, the valves and the pumping machine. So, the computer records the sound waves, echoes and displays a picture of the heart, how exactly the heart is functioning, how exactly the heart is beating, whether the uh, particular valves for the hearts are functioning properly or not, how the heart muscles are working over there and how exactly the pumping is being done. So, with, with the help of the echo, the doctor gets an image about the heart as well as the pumping capacity of the heart along with the EKG readings over there. Now, the next is the two dimensional echo which is many a times referred as the 2D echo. So, this technique is used to see the actual structures and the motions of the heart structure at function. So, the ultrasound is transmitted across several lines uh, over a uh, wide angle and many times per second. So, with the help of this transfer of the images, the heart images are being uh, formed with the combination of the reflected ultrasound signals which builds up an image onto the display screen. So, the ultrasound transducer, it transfers the sound waves a number of times at various different angles and then these angle images are collated with the help of the computer monitor and we get a ultrasound signals built image on the screen which gives us an idea how exactly the heart is functioning, how exactly the pumping is being done, how the valves are functioning and the other mechanism. The next one is called as the transesophageal echocardiogram. So, 
this is many a times referred as TEE test uh, over here. So, in this test the patient swallow a small probe about a size of a finger. The probe passes down the esophagus near the heart and it allows a closer look at the heart structure and function. It also shows a abnormal tissue around your heart valve if there is anything. Is there any blood which is leaking backward towards the valve or is there any blood clots which are present within the heart chambers. So, the, uh, the probe or the transesophageal probe which is being shown over here, it gives us a better image to the doctor whether there is any kind of leakage from the valves taking place, is there any kind of blood clotting which is present within the heart chambers and is there any abnormal tissues which are present around your heart valve. Now, if we see the image over here, the doctor places a T probe into the mouth and as it is put into the mouth, it moves down the esophagus. So, as it moves down the esophagus, which is the area, gastrointestinal area present near the heart, the uh, transesophageal echocardiogram probe in the esophagus, it start probing or sending the pictures with the help of its cameras onto the screen. So, now, it, uh, the sound waves create a picture of the heart and these sound wave created pictures are then transferred onto the monitor screen where we get a idea how exactly the heart is functioning. So, the patient lies on the bed on the left side uh, on his left side and subsequently the images are being taken out. So, th we can see the electrocardiogram with the help of the TE probe which is shown over here. So, we can see the heart, the ventricles and the atria with the help of the transesophageal electrocardiogram graphy probe which is shown over here. Now, this image also represents how exactly the TEE test is done. So, the TEE probe is transferred from the mouth into the esophagus. So, a endoscopy moves inside the esophagus which contains the TEE probe and these esophageal echocardiography transducer then sends the sound waves and with the help of the sound waves the images of the hearts are created and these sound waves images are then transferred onto the monitors where a uh, heart image or a heart chamber image is being created and with the help of these images one can determine if the person is having a normal functioning heart, is there any abnormal mass which is present near the valves? If the valves are functioning properly or not, is there any leakage of any blood from these valves or is there any mal, uh, uh, expansion or inflammation on any of the chambers of the heart or not. So, with the help of the sound waves created images, the doctor can recommend how exactly the heart functioning or the cardiovascular disease is being moved out. The next one is called as the cardiac PET scan, just like the PET scan which we do for the other diseases. So, the PET scan of the heart is a non-invasive nuclear uh, imaging test which is being done. It uses a radio tracer, uh, uh, radioactive tracer which is many a times referred as the radionucleotide to produce the pictures of the heart. So, the doctor used the cardiac PET scan to disease, uh, diagnose the various diseases such as the coronary artery, artery disease and if there is any damage due to heart attack. So, the PET scan can show healthy and damaged heart muscles. The doctor generally use the PET scans to find out the benefits of the various, um, uh, various interventions such as the angioplasty or stenting which has been done onto the patient's heart or the blood vessels. So, the PET scan gives a doctor a very accurate way of diagnosis. Uh, the coronary artery disease and detect the area of blood, low blood flow in the heart and the PET scan also identifies the dead tissues and injured uh, tissue that are still living and functioning. If the tissue is viable, you may benefit from a PCI or coronary artery bypass surgery. So, the PET scan plays a very important role in tracing out how exactly the heart is functioning um, and whether to diagnose the coronary artery diseases. Now, this is a PET scan which is shown over here. The PET scan shows the various images. So, the first PET scan is the CT transmission scan which is shown over here. Then the second one is the attenuations corrected 
PET emission scan, then the PET scan fusion is shown over here, then the non attenuation correction emission scan which is also shown over here. So, with the help of the PET scan, the doctor can find out how exactly the various chambers of the hearts are functioning, is there any dead tissues or the dead muscle cells which have been formed in the heart uh, muscle cells and how exactly the valves are being functioning over there. Now, there are some of the quick facts about the PET scan. So, the PET scan uses the radioactive material called the tracers and these tracers are generally mixed with your blood and they are taken up by the heart uh, muscles. Then a special uh, gamma detector that encircles the chest picks up the signal from the tracers and a computer converts the signals into pictures of your heart at work. A PET scan shows your heart if the heart is getting enough um, blood or not and whether the blood flow is reduced because of narrow arteries, is there any dead cells uh, prior to the heart attack. A PET scan also helps you to determine the cardiac procedure, whether the cardiac procedure has went right or not. The tracer used for the PET scan can help to identify the injured but still living heart muscles and will help to detect how exactly the blood flow is done. So, we can see the image over here that is a PET CT scan for the cardiac scan which is shown over here. So, the PET scan helps the doctors to pick out how exactly the heart is functioning, whether the heart is getting enough blood or not and is there any reduction of the blood supply to any part of the heart due to the narrowing of the arteries because of any kind of uh, the formation of or uh, accumulation of the lipids over there or not and how exactly the patient is uh, uh, function heart is functioning after certain uh, cardiac procedures such as the angioplasty or stents which have been put into that one and subsequently the tracers also helps the doctor to trace out and identify the injured part of the heart if they are still uh, viable or living or whether they have formed into the dead cells and how exactly the pumping is taking place over there. The next one is called as the electrophysiology test which are being done. So, these tests are basically these tests use insulated electric uh, catheters which are placed through the large vein in the upper leg and thread into the heart and these helps the doctor to trace out the heart's electrical system and find irregular heart rhythms. Now, we can see over here how exactly the electrochemistry, electropathological tests are being done. So, we can see over here the catheter is inserted into the internal jugular vein or it is uh, uh, inserted into the groin or the arm region over there. So, the, uh, the catheter is then inserted and then the subsequently the catheter is inserted through these veins or the arteries into the hearts. Now, this diagram represents and shows how exactly the catheterization is being done. So, the catheter is ma manipulated by the doctor and it is commonly inserted into a blood vessels in the groin region and subsequently the catheter is pushed up uh, the large blood vessels into the heart. So, into the heart if we can see the aorta behind the heart, through the aorta behind the heart, the catheter has moved into the left ventricle and from the left ventricle it has moved to the aorta, the large blood vessel. So, with the help of these catheters, the electrical signals are then transferred onto the computers and they are being recorded. Now, what is the importance of these electrophysiology studies or the EPS studies which are being done? So, the electrophysical studies basically help the doctor to understand the nature of abnormal heart rhythms. So, the electrophysiological studies or the test helps the doctor to check and record the electrical activity of the heart to find if there is any arrhythmia or abnormal heartbeat which is functioning over there and it helps the doctor also to give medicines in the patients who are having a pacemaker or ca cardio water defibrillator or the cardiac ablator or surgery any kind of surgery. So, these studies takes place in special rooms which are called as the electrophysiology lab or catheterization labs 
and uh, the patient is mildly sedated for these particular tests. So, with the help of these catheters, they are moved into the major veins or the arteries within the body into the heart and then the electrophysiology of how exactly the heart is pumping up, what exactly is functioning is being done by the hearts is also checked upon. Now, the next one which comes is called as the coronary angiography. So, in the coronary angiography, the catheter again is inserted into the blood vessels in the groins regions and from there the, uh, the catheter is pushed up the large blood vessels into the heart. From the heart, the catheter is put in, pushed inside the right coronary artery and from there the catheter passes up the aorta behind the heart. So, over here the various recordings of the hearts are also then taking place. Now, how exactly the procedure is done? During this procedure which is many a times referred as the coronary angiography, the patient is positioned on a x-ray table. So, subsequently depending upon the consider, uh, condition of the arteries, either the underarm or the groin areas are being uh, anesthetized or disinfected or they are numbed with the help of the anesthesia. Subsequently, a long tube, narrow tube which is many a times referred as the catheter is then inserted into the large artery in either the upper leg or, or, or upper arm region and gently a thread into the coronary artery around the heart muscles is then pushed in. So, we can see over here the catheter insertion which is taking place in the femoral artery which is shown over here. Then the catheter is pushed in through this femoral artery into the heart region and then subsequently the electrophysiology of the heart functioning is taking place. Now, the next one is called as the laser Doppler flowmetry test or LDF test. So, it is again a non-invasive method which is done to estimate the blood perfusion in the microcirculation. This test was first introduced over 30 years ago and has done a continuous number of developments have occurred through this particular test. This works present through a theoretical framework of the technique. It describes in how detail the laser light interacts with the tissue and the moving red blood cells, how the light forms a speckle pattern on the detector and how frequency content of the formed speckle pattern can be used to estimate the blood perfusions. Now, over here the uh, laser Doppler flow metry is method is being shown over here. So, it is a method for the assessment of the microvascular uh, blood perfusion. So, the Doppler word basically refers to the frequency shift that arises in the light has occurred from scattering of the moving red blood cells. So, this fundamental principle constitutes the basic of the laser Doppler flow metry theory. So, in other words by illuminating a tissue sample with single frequency light and processing the frequency distribution of the back scattered light and estimate of the blood perfusions can be achieved. So, the laser Doppler flow metry subsequently help the, uh, the doctors to assess the microvascular blood perfusion which is taking place within the heart, how exactly the blood flow is taking place and this is basically the back scattering light which is done due to the movement of the red blood cells. The next one is called as the magnetic resonance imaging of the heart. So, this is a procedure which is used by combination of large magnets and radio frequency and which takes up a detailed imaging of the organs and the structure. So, the magnet res resonance angiography MRA of the heart is being done where which evaluates the blood vessels in your heart. So, we can see over here the magnetic resonance imaging which is done over here. So, there are different magnets uh, which are present. So, this is a 3D angiogram of the heart which is shown over here. So, we can see the normal left ventricle damaged left ventricle from the heart, left ventricle not receiving enough amount of word, uh, blood. So, the, with the help of these images, we can decipher out how exactly the heart is functioning, what is the pumping capacity, how exactly the microcirculation of the blood is taking place through the various uh, uh, processes and various blood vessels of the heart. So, this is a image which is showing 
what exactly the magnetic resonance imaging is being done and how exactly the machine takes up the various images over there and with the help of these images the collation is being done and a proper imaging of the heart is then deciphered out. So, with this note I come to the end of my lecture where I have discussed the various techniques and the various methods with the help of which we can discuss and describe the electrophysiology of the heart, how exactly the heart is pumping the blood, how exactly the chambers of the hearts are functioning, whether there is any kind of malfunction in the valves, any leakage of the valves, is there any abnormal tissues which is present in the heart muscle cells and how exactly the blood vessels are pumping the blood into the uh, hearts over there. So, with this note, I thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us uh, this session. And friends, we believe that your feedbacks are important for us as well as your questions too. So, if you have any, do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. We are going to meet again very soon and would we'll be discussing on some other topic. Till then, take care. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you once again.